Hi, welcome to the New Writer Podcast, Episode 1. Tonight I have with me writer Jamie Moulton, uh, author of the Arts Reborn series, uh, fantasy author, and hello. How are you doing tonight, Jamie? Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's um, doing great. Hey, so um, the interview format for this show is pretty simple. Uh, I've only got five questions. Four of them are always going to be the same, and the fourth question asked is completely random, and I'm hoping I can catch you off guard with the one I've got ready for you tonight. Um, so the first question, of course, is the most obvious, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I am a writer, as you know, on that side. Um, that's been more more recently seriously visited in my life, uh, but, but I've been writing and reading ever since I was little. Um, took a break towards the end of high school and started to get into some computer stuff, and have worked in that field for the last decade and a half, and uh, really got back into the writing side maybe five years ago, um, a bit more than that, when when my son was little and I started to go to the library to get little kid books for him, and I started seeing all those books that started calling to me, and uh, that got me onto that side, uh, and the ideas started to come back, and I they were they kept talking to me, the characters and the, the worlds, and needed to, to get them down on the page, and um, so I still do uh, some IT-related consulting as well. Um, I'm Canadian, so if I sound a little bit different, this is my Ontario accent. I'm in the Toronto area, born and raised in Toronto. Um, I don't I know, any, any other random stuff you want to know about me? I, I have to admit, I was a little disappointed when we first started talking because I haven't heard you say a boot or a yet. Yeah, I say about. Does that sound any different from where yeah. you're from? I don't know. Sounds bit. about right. <laughs> yeah. I also, I'm, I, I don't know, I, I'm pretty good with accents, I can mimic some accents, and sometimes I'll, I'll morph a little bit into whoever I'm talking to or, or listening to a lot, so. Uh, I, I do that too, and I'm not sure if it's, you're also a gamer, Yeah. and I don't know if it's something from being a gamer or if it's something writers do, but I do it a lot. I have a hard time not picking up other people's mannerisms. I think it's partly because I did, I studied a little bit of linguistics, and I've, I've studied various different languages. I lived in Hong Kong for a year, and I also watched a lot of British television as a kid, because that's pretty much the only television my mother would watch, so I was always into accents and trying to mimic them and listening to them, and I don't know, I've had, I've had some fun. One time when I was down in, this, down in the States doing some training, and we had people from all over the world, but all sorts of different regional American accents, and I've since developed some ability to sometimes mimic them, but I won't do it here. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I I recently moved from Kansas City to Helena, Montana, and Kansas City is used as a training ground for our newscasters here in the U.S. because our accent is considered neutral. And since I've gotten here, people have told me that I have a heavy Southern accent, and I just am like, wow. I don't hear it. <laughs> No, similarly, actually, there's a there's been a number of major U.S. network newscasters who've been from Ontario um, because our our accent's a fairly neutral one and tends to be pretty clear. And people, I don't know, I haven't had much trouble being understood by even second language English speakers from anywhere in the world that I've been to. So it's good and useful, I guess. Yeah, that's I've noticed. Um, in Canada, it's kind of like coastal. Like the coasts have the same accent, and the center has crazy regional accents, at least from the people I've spoken to from Canada. And and the coastal accents in Canada sound a lot like what we consider the neutral Midwestern accent out here. Um, a little last nasal. I, I'm just talking to you tonight. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. No, that's, I, I, again, I could talk about accents all day, but that's probably not, not yeah. the only thing people want to hear. But yeah, probably not what they... they so you write um, a, fan, a historical fantasy... I right. sort of, yeah. I, I call it historically inspired fantasy, yeah. just because there's a lot of this. I don't know. There's some people that talk about alternate history. Some people talk about historical fantasy, and sort of, I don't know. They're like anything. Once you get to start talking about genres and the writer and reader community, you get people who are purists saying, "Here's my little box of exactly what it should be," and then you get people that are blending all over the place, and, um, especially in this new world with lots of people publishing lots of really interesting things. That's getting a little bit more complicated. So. I'd say I, I, I borrow from history and I, I try and root things in sort of historical periods in an interesting way, but without being, I'm, you know, I'm not saying this is our world and then something happened to change it. Not, not in my course series that I'm working on right now. But on a short story I just did, I'm actually exactly doing that, starting from exactly something historical, having something magical that's now taking it in a different way. So. And is that your short story for the uh, fiction unboxing anthology? That's right. 
yeah, so it's uh, I'm starting in a point in history in China, and so it's but it's still it is connected to the the Dream Engine book, and then uh, things will go in a different way, and I, I I would love to write more on that side as well. So, see, that's I I went into Fiction Unboxed fully thinking I'm going to write something, I'm going to love this, I love steampunk, I love alternative history fantasy, and then I went, eh. And got sidetracked with so many other things. So I, I didn't even finish watching all the fiction unboxed yet. <laughs> so um, I actually I have not read your book yet. I did, however, go and check it out and I put it on my to be read list. Um, and I, something very interesting. I want I want to I want you to ask you. Um, I'm a big fantasy fan. I love magic systems, especially. Like one of my Sanderson is one of my favorite writers, and he does crazy things with magic systems that just are awesome. And yours seemed really unique. So can you tell me more about that? Sure. Um, I guess sort of one of the, one of the taglines I used at some point for the series. The series is called Arts Reborn, and it's really there are people for whom creativity is magic, so they can express it through whatever their creative ability is, and. The, but the funny thing about it is that hasn't really been happening in a long time. So nobody, there's, there's a few hidden pockets of people that know a bit about how to explore that, but in general, people don't. So the, the general populace thinks magic is part of their mythology or you know, legends, that sort of thing. Um, but there's, there's people that have a magical talent, and then they can express it through their creative, creative ability. So if you were an artist like a painter, there'd be ways that you can express it there. And I go into quite a few different ways that that can happen. And really it's whatever your imagine, whatever their imagination is and their skill at doing whatever it is, whatever their type of uh, artistic form is, um, that's the sort of components that they need to work with. Now, do you have a background with uh, painting and more textile art? Um, I do. I actually, uh, I, I took art all the way through high school. Um, actually, my my father's parents were both professional artists. Um, for any Canadians out there, art history majors, uh, my my great or my grandfather actually knew Tommy Thompson and some of the people from the Group of Seven, so some Canadian painters. So I come by it honestly on that side, and then my mother actually completely the other side studied art history as well. So um, I, I do paint. Um, it's too bad I should have could have had one of my paintings in here, um, but paint and draw. And I again from a young age, uh, you know, fan, reading fantasy and playing games related to that, doing various forms of art, and watching things like Doctor Who and other, you know, some sci-fi and fantasy type stuff were pillars of my life. So, so yeah, so I absolutely have that side. And then my sister sings, and so I have, you know, I'll sing a bit too. And so different, the performance arts can get into this as well, but that's not the point. So did you, um, <clears throat> they say you're not supposed to do your own covers? But I right. do, and my covers probably suck. But did you do your cover, or did you have someone else do it, or? No, I actually. I, it's funny because I actually played with Photoshop a lot back when I was uh, back in high school, um, and I'd learned it you know, like fairly early on. So I, I technically could relearn all the skills to do it, and luckily my wife is smart enough to say, no, that's gonna. It's a huge rabbit hole of time that you're going to spend so much time doing that you'll never get any writing done, and she's absolutely right. So I did. No, I, I had a cover designer, so there's there's my cover. I did actually, though. I probably can't see it from there, but you can see online or on my website. The I did do the map because I used to draw lots of role playing game maps back in uh, earlier days, or copy Tolkien's maps, or do different things like that. So I did I did do the map, and then I had some of the conceptual idea for it, and then passed that on to a designer who did it. So okay, Jerry, really you. thank you. I really like it. I think it's an awesome cover. <laughs> I like it too, and, and I like my book two cover even more. Now that one, I actually have some involvement with. So yeah. now, and that, let's take that as a segue to the second question, which is, tell us about your book. You've already told us a little bit, but uh, your second book actually just came out, right? Literally just came out. Yeah, it's uh, it came out on Amazon.com last night, basically as an ebook. Um, paper is in process, probably sometime in September. And uh, yeah, no, I've, the, the first, so I guess the first so in the series, the Arts Reborn series, the first book, Brush with Darkness, came out in March, um, and then the second one just now in August, and the third one's underway. But I'm also actually going to take a detour with a at a 2.5 novella that actually fits in between the uh, the events of the second. And there's something is it 
was it you that was talking about that the other day or someone? No, no, it was someone else I was, I was hearing, talking to. I, I couldn't remember whether it was on your first podcast episode or one, another one that I was listening to recently. Um, someone was talking about how they had something on the back burner, but now because those events are important in the next thing or they just need to know it, they're like, well, I may as well write that first so that I can make that happen. Because it, It's basically kind of like a side quest that's going to be a single, single point of view side quest that's going to happen in between the two books, and so that's going to be the novella 2.5. I'm, I'm excited about it, actually. I was just, just figured out some things while I was driving last night of how some point of view -y stuff on that, and it's going to be very different, but uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, so that's that. I, I guess I, I should probably talk a little bit more about the book overall. I talked about yeah. the art side. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the first book is really, imagine a setting like ancient Rome uh, in the time of the Republic. So like the, the, the TV show Rome, or like the time of Caesar, sort of that that's sort of a Rome in the Mediterranean where you've got this big republic, so not an empire, but a republic um, that's in control of most of the area. And magic doesn't really, doesn't really exist. People will just believe it does, just like they did in those times. And now it's starting to come back. There's some dark magic that appears and creates a threat, and then now some of these people that are exposed to that are going to start to come up on the, uh, um, like the creative magic and have to explore stuff that was buried within them that had sort of been pushed aside in their life, like so many people in the arts, um, and then needs to explore that and develop that to then go on and confront that, that threat to the whole republic. And so it starts out looking a little military. It's got some, uh, you know, romantic subplot to it as well. It kind of blends a number of different things together, but I, I think it's a lot of fun. It's the kind of thing that I would like to read, and I, uh, so that was the book one. And, and then book two gets even, draws in some little bits of Spartacus-ish related things, and also some... Indiana Jones-ish almost, where they're exploring the ancient historical stuff there to find clues about the past. So I've got some neat stuff. So I'm, I, I, I like book one a lot. I like book two even more. So I'm excited. And we were talking before the show, and you're, it's planned to be a five-book series, right? That's right. The, the, the arc. So and it's, it's, this is not a serial. This is a series where yeah. the first book stands alone as a story. The second book stands alone as a story. But there are arcs, and there's definitely things you'd want to know mm -hmm. Um, happening, you know, in the future. You're interested, you're hopefully invested in the characters, but and so I've got the major arcs that are coming for the next, you know, for the rest of the series, um, and sort of the main the main climax or so on, on the, the various books, but uh, it's I'm excited about that. And then I've got a lot of side different things. I've got actually one tie-in short story that I'll be releasing at some point, and I've got another one that I may be I'll, I'll be releasing at some point. I've got some other ideas of exploring some of the characters' backstories, or different side things as well. So I, it's, a, it's a rich world that I'd love to continue to explore and see where the characters take me. Yeah, are you willing to tell us, right, to promise us right now, uh, like George Martin will not, that this will be five books and that's it? You're saying it's five books? Yeah, this, this, <laughs> this series of the major, major arcs of what's going on with this would be five books. I'm not saying that there couldn't be stuff that then comes subsequent to that, but well, yeah. it would be this would be a five-book series. And I want to get this... You know, to, to avoid the other George R. R. Martin or Patrick Ruffus where your fans are beating down your, you know, beating your beating you on the back to try and get you to finish the next book. Um, I want to I want to definitely have those first five done by sometime early next year, and, and publish. I, I won't, don't know exactly the publishing schedule on that, but that's sort of the plan. Yeah. You you don't want to risk Robert Jordaning us. That's right. Which that's. I hear a lot of people talking about the Wheel of Time series and the fact that that happened, and they all forget that he did the exact same. In the 80s, he wrote a, a Conan spinoff series under a pen name and got like eight books into a supposed 20-book series and then just faked his own death as a, under, the, under that pen name. Released a press release that he died and everything. And I'm like, you got the end of Wheel of Time. You can't complain about that. So then you're saying he did actually die. So, he, uh, did. He, he did. It wasn't just a publicity stunt. In I don't case. believe so. Um, if, if he if it was just going to be a publicity stunt, I don't know why he would have hired Brandon Sanderson to there come in and finish the series. So. Unless he regenerates. Uh, do you think Robert Jordan regenerated into Brandon Sanderson like the Doctor? That's an interesting theory, and I think Brandon would think that was pretty funny. But. <laughs> well, you could, he, he always... Robert Jordan is his biggest influence, so... Yeah. Um, which is a really less awkward segue into my third question of the night, which is um, tell us about your influences. 
that's a it's it's a funny one. There's there's so many. Like I I don't have one writer like one author that I'm like that's the one and I want to pattern myself after that or that sort of thing. Um, I I started reading at a very young age and I was lucky enough to have a mother that got me reading. Like I, I've told the story before, but or, um, in other places, but literally the first book that I remember starting to read myself was uh, The Horse and His Boy. So book three by that you know Tolkien or not Tolkien uh, C. S. Lewis's preferred numbering of the Chronicles of, Chronicles of mm -hmm. Narnia, and she, she'd been reading me first two, and then at some point in that third book, and I was about three at the time, so I started reading early, um, that's where I started, the, I just picked it up and was like, okay, I'm, I don't want to wait for you and my little sister, and so I, I just started reading it on my own, so um, I was reading C.S. Lewis, and then I was reading Tolkien fairly soon after that, so I had a firm grounding in some master masters in fantasy in a couple of different flavors, percolating from when I was a young age, um, got into a lot of the sort of RPG spin-off ones, like the Dragon Lances and the, or, or just other ones at the similar times, like the David Eddings or Pern or all those different things in, through those years. Um, so it's just that was just sort of in the background. But the some of the authors that really got me into the historical side were just I was lucky enough that in grade twelve or twelfth grade, as you might say, um, the like the book cart we had to choose some books from had James Clavell, um, so Shogun and Taipan and Gaijin and some of those books. So got into that side and said, wow, this is really cool. And at the same time, uh, I was up at a cottage, and Colleen McCullough's book, The First Man in Rome, uh, this is the first book of her Rome series, was on, someone had left it on the bedside table at the cottage that we rented. And I started reading that, and I was like, this is incredible. I loved it. And that, that impatterned me, that time period, and sort of the whole, whole the way that that republic worked was so fascinating, and I just have always had ideas of that. I tried to pull that into some of the... RPG type stuff that I did and my friends were like, hey, stop with the governmental, you know, messing around in councils and stuff. We, uh, I ran a live action role playing game for close to a decade and a friend of mine and I, were, we were like, we have to develop an elven culture because uh, the guys who founded the game had created this awesome timeline and there was a huge part of it was this elven empire that the 12 provinces and we were like, you can't just have something like that out there without having something to cement it to. And at the time, like, we were very much into, uh, we were playing L5R also on the side, so we were very much into the Rokugani kind of uh, mutation of Japanese culture. And what we settled on was we were going to take the Roman uh, senatorial empire and combine it with the kind of clan-like imperial Rokugani net network, and that was how we were going to build our elves. And I had to do a ton of research on Rome, and none of it ever got used. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I've, so I've, I've been reading in that space, and I, I just love those books. And I loved her, I love Colleen McCullough's approach to historical fiction, too. And I just, that's, that series remains one of my favorite series ever. Um, and then, then things disappeared for a while, and I read a little bit, like I, I read some, like got into the Terry Goodkind books, and were, that was ones that I would read with my, like talk about it with my wife as well, when she started reading more fantasy once once we got married, um, but through university and some of the time after that, I was much more into nonfiction for a while and had lost the. That's a anyway. I could I could talk about that area, but more recently, getting back into some of the other people taking their takes on Rome, um, like Connor Golden's series, and he also did his Mongol series that's really cool, like straight historical fiction, or Douglas Jackson's one that does some empire stuff that's really quite interesting. Um, and uh, MC Scott is reading a book there, so I've, I always like to read that stuff and see how people are addressing the historical fiction. But the one that sort of unlocked things for me and got me moving in a different direction was uh, Canadian author Guy Gabriel Kay, who I don't know if you've ever read anything by him, but I have not. He was lucky enough to be working with uh, Christopher Tolkien on the editing of, I believe it was the Silmarillion back in the '70s, and that's when he started writing his straight fantasy, where he had some like University of Toronto students going to a fantasy world and. Um, with his Fionavar tapestry series, but the uh, what he writes, and he, there, I, just, I read this thing from him online. I was actually some of his, another one of those random things where someone had left a book, and it was his. I can't remember whichever is the first of the two, but River of Heaven or Under No River of Stars or Under Heaven are two that he wrote that are in China. And what he does is he says, I don't want to write straight historical fiction where I'm putting words and inventing things that a real person said. And trying to fill in those gaps because I he he feels like that's disrespectful of disrespectful of history. I'm I'm okay with it, but I think it's it was just an interesting approach. So what he does is he takes the elements and the themes and things that are happening there and 
changes it. So instead of China, he has his empire of Kitai, which is very much like China, and places will be very much like China, and some of the situations of the end of the dynasty is very much like China, but it's blending together, pulling from different periods a little bit, and pulling different characters together to make the story that he wants to tell, and, and then lets it go. And So it's just a really, really... And he'll have some supernatural elements of like the folklore and stuff in there. So, so Sterling and Stone would say that you th he throws a unicorn in it. Well, he doesn't go that far, because he does take very much... It's, it's not quite that far, no. but, it's, but it's a really neat take on it, and I just said, wow, that's, that's so cool, and that let me get past the, do I want to take, try and take a Rome and then adding a bit of a, a magical thing? Like, there's an author, Thomas Harlan, who did that of about 400 AD, 500 AD, made Rome not fall, and there's magic, and that was, that was a neat take on it. Um, but I liked, so I've got mine where it's based on a lot of these similar things in my own way, borrowing heavily, but I can do whatever I want, so... That's that's my take on it, and that's so that those things have come together to uh, the historical side, the fantasy side, and here we are today with what I'm writing. So, yes, and when we were talking before the show, uh, we were talking about Doctor Who because that's what geeks do, and most writers are geeks. Uh, and you said you became a you became a writer so that you could time travel. It's it's honestly, I I, I really think that's true. It's like I don't have a TARDIS. I'm never going to have a TARDIS, but I can. I can live somewhere else, and, and my, my characters can live in these other different worlds if I'm a writer, and I, I just think that's a wonderful idea, and that's why I really, one of, one of the things I say about my characters, it's really, I get the ideas, and I love the world building side, but then it's, it's just grabbing a hold of these characters and seeing where they take me, and, and what's going to happen, and I, I just love that, and, and being able to explore these different time periods, and it's, I love it, I, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. So are you ready for the fourth question? Because it's a doozy. This is the screwball? Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. All right, here it is. Would you rather fight a toddler on cocaine or a bear the size of a chihuahua? Toddler on cocaine or a bear the size of a chihuahua? See, I have, I, I have a five-and-a-half-year-old and I have a two-and-a-half-year-old. and Just no matter how crazy they're being, you're still tall and have leverage and they're not that sharp clawed and that sort of thing. So I think I'd probably go for the toddler side and maybe I could reason with them. Yeah, I think that's my take. <laughs> See, I would have gone with the bear because normal toddlers have injured me before. And I think a bear the size of you, can punch a chihuahua. <laughs> True. True. So that I guess, and it's, it's, it's not like the you know, it's not like the it's defending its cubs or something, and its cubs are like this big. I don't know. <laughs> that adds a whole new level to it. That question, by the way, is brought to us by Barguments.com. Barguments.com. Okay. Yeah, um, arguments that have no real answer. <laughs> Future sponsor, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, I was, I was, that's um, neither here nor there. I don't really worry about things like that. Uh, we were actually talking a little before the show about. Uh, Writers need to get themselves out there and doing things that make you feel, well, ooky, I guess, would be the word. And so, like, sponsorship is one of those things that just makes me go, ugh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, like, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to do right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I, I will say, um, when I'm listening to self-publishing podcasts and they do their horrible ad reads, I'm like, you know it's a product that they they actually use, and they're not catering to their people paying them. <laughs> so, not kowtowing, I guess. Right. Well, I'd, I'd say like the two the two good sponsorships I've seen were uh, join a pen with the creative pen with Kobo because that just works and it just makes total sense. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is the the writing excuses podcast with Audible. Um, oh, yeah. You know, they're that's big time, and they're they're doing you know they're they're all. You know, very successful authors, but it's just it, it, it is a marriage made in heaven, and they all love audiobooks. They have Mary Robinet Cole is an audiobook narrator, and it's just uh, it's perfect. So it can yeah. work. It's just it's it's hard to do right. I say I actually am having a hard time. I, I I did a lot of driving for years, so I started listening to audiobooks, and I got really into audiobooks as my preferred way of reading. And I kind of stopped reading normal. Just reading in general. I have to admit, I stopped reading for a long time. And now I'm discovering a lot of these really awesome writers and 
their stuff's not available in audio yet, so I'm like, ah, I gotta learn to read. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm, my main reading time is right before I go to bed. Um, I always say that I, if I don't read somebody else's fiction before I go to bed, my brain and my characters aren't gonna let me sleep. So it just, it sort of takes me out of that, and it was something I learned from, uh, I think it was actually Tim Ferriss that was mentioning, like, he has trouble sleeping, and it was getting, that helped him to just get out of all his businessy stuff, and when I was doing some more businessy stuff, that, that helped with that, too. So every night before bed, I'll read to my son, and then I'll do my own reading. Yes, so. I think that's, I think that's in Four, four, uh, four Hour work week. he talks yeah. about reading fiction. And, that, and that's only in a book, like, it, you know, that doesn't work as an audiobook, so that's, uh, I never got into them that much, and since audiobooks are becoming bigger, uh, I just, I haven't been commuting, so I haven't had that need. Yeah, and that's, we were, again, we were talking about Doctor Who, for people who are watching this or listening to it later. Um, and you told me that your dream narrator was Tom Baker. Yeah. I was, it's funny. I, I, there's, there's several of the Doctors I actually wouldn't mind being my dream narrator of a book. But Tom, I, I just love Tom Baker's voice and his delivery of various different things. And I just think he's so interesting to listen to. And yeah, if I could get that. Although hearing like women's parts narrated by him might be a little bit odd, so I don't know how well how well that would work, but um, and I was saying that, and, and I was just saying too, like that, he's one of my dream narrators, the other one, like the, the, but the, the author that's done the best job that I've heard so far was Neil Gaiman's stuff, and he just is spectacular at doing, making those characters different, and in his own way, without, without doing, you know, without being over the top about it, mm -hmm. and he's, I, I just thought he does a great job. I will say, I recently um, read one of my short stories um, on YouTube, and it is hard. And I will never do it again. <laughs> I I will try. I'm I'm gonna I'm, I will try my hand at it at some point. Not yet, but I I, I like to I, I love to tell stories. Actually, at one point in uh, I think it was early high school, I took a, a storytelling course that was put on at our one of our local libraries, and they had sessions of just different techniques and different things for doing that. And, and my mother always read to me, and she always used different voices a little bit, and just tried to really get into it. So that's that's what I do. And my wife says she feels intimidated to read to my kids after that because I do that. I guess it's a pretty good job. Since uh, I did uh, forensics in high school, uh, not medical science forensics, like uh, speech and debate forensics, and I did prose interpretation, which is literally you read a book with voices. And I did that, that YouTube video, and I went, I have not gotten any better in the last 12 years. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> So I, I and it hurt my throat. It hurt my throat to do it. So, um, okay. Well, we're about half an hour, and that's I'm kind of wanting to keep to about half an hour schedule. So, the last question is um, a book recommendation other than yours that you think our viewers and listeners should read. It's funny. As soon as you get into the should read, I I I, I draw a blank on the fiction side of what. Um, you know, what, like one book, because there's just so many different tastes. But okay. on the nonfiction side, we already mentioned the one that I think has been just yeah. hugely useful to me, um, and that's The 4-Hour Workweek, actually, by, by Tim Ferriss. Um, I, I think no matter what you do and where you want to go, uh, that's, that's a fantastic book to read just to evaluate your own mindset. And the techniques in there are what I used as a full-time employee to figure out what it was I really wanted to be spending my time on outside of work or inside of work and figuring out how to become more efficient, more effective at doing those so I could carve out more time to do those things. And I just continued to refine those skills and, and that's led me ultimately to here as writing is the thing I want to carve out as much time for as possible and, and do those things as efficiently as possible. And that's what's led me to seek out things like what you're saying, the self-publishing podcast and guys like that for learning from what other people are doing and their you know, their writing and publishing processes to, to do this the best I can and, and you know, have, get, have me using my energies in the best way, uh, you know, maximizing my time and then delegating or outsourcing or whatever those pieces as I can as I go along when I, when I know what's not my highest and best use of my time, my, uh, what is it, my 80%, you know, making sure I'm not doing too much on those 20% activities as, as he would say or as, as Sean would say on, on SBK. I, I got to admit, I'm a 20% person all the way. I want, I want to do 20% of the effort for, or get 20% of the results for 80% of the effort. But uh, I'm bad about it. I, 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 I'm not saying I'm not easily distractible. I'm just yeah. saying I, I know where I should be going, and I 
try and work on that and hire my wife to to say, hey, this isn't what you should be doing. So. As I, I bought Tim Ferriss's book as one of those books where I was like, I'm going to learn to not be so horribly bad at use of my time. And there's so many, and, and I did. I learned a lot of things that I use at work, and it just I found that I create more time to do things that are completely unimportant. <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you for being on the show. Um, where can everybody find you at? Where can they get in touch with you? You know. Sure. Um, well, my website is uh, jamiemaltman.com, so J-A-M-I-E-M-A-L-T-M-A-N. Um, so you can find me from there. Uh, I'm moderately active on Google+. Plus. I'm around on Twitter, but I might be talking about writing stuff during basketball season. I might be talking a lot about my Toronto Raptors, so that's... I, I, I do a lot of sports fanny connection stuff on Twitter. Um, uh, I do have a Facebook author page as well where people can connect and see what's going on with my with my writing side there. Um, and Goodreads, actually, because I'm an avid reader, so I am, I'm, I'm around there as well. So lots of places to find me. So, and both of your books are in uh, Kindle Unlimited, right? They are right now, yeah. Um, so I've got, uh, well, again, the book one is also in paper, so you can find those on Amazon. Um, and, yeah, they're both in... Kindle Unlimited, um, and which means also the lending library for the Prime members in the U.S. or the U.K. It is something that we do not have up here, so we don't have Kindle Unlimited, and our Prime just gets us free shipping. It does not get us borrowing books. Ah, oh, that's that's Amazon is really going on, on the job in, in Canada. No, it's, uh, it's just it's just it's complicated. It's it's rights issues. It's there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's Canadian content. You probably stuff that they try to control that there's protectivist stuff to some extent I'm sure but yeah I, I don't blame Amazon for it but I, I would love it if they could get some of those things up here well thank you for being on I had a really good time I enjoyed talking to you especially you know I, I wish now that we had gone back and just started on air at 630 when we first started talking because I think I enjoyed that a lot <laughs> And um, I, I personally will be reading your book sometime in the next few months. I've got a long list of to, to read, so mine uh, keeps growing. Yeah, but thank you very much, and um, everybody at home, thank you for watching. Feel free to comment or email uh, contact at newwriterpodcast.com, and I'll see you. I don't have a guest lined up yet for next Wednesday, but on the Wednesday after that, I have Michael Laurent will be on the show. So. Thank you guys. Uh, have a wonderful evening.